we'll probably look back at giving a 13-year-old social media the same way that we look today at giving a 13-year-old a pack of cigarettes. Because we're learning that the brain at that point really can't handle the forces that are unleashed by these sort of highly optimized tools, which are built to exploit psychological vulnerabilities in order to get a lot of uses, just like we uh, artificially increase the nicotine content in the tobacco and cigarettes because we wanted people to smoke more. There seems to be, from the most recent research literature, sort of one distinctly positive thing from social media and two distinctly negative. So the two distinctly negative things is, they call it social snacking, but essentially you replace actual high quality face-to-face -face interaction, the type of connections that you need to thrive as a social being, you replace it with a low friction interaction online, and it's not a fair trade. Uh, the second issue is social comparison. So it's just not healthy for us to constantly be looking at these carefully curated positive portrayals of everyone's life. That's not, we're not wired for it. And so that also makes us less happy. So it's, it's, those are probably the two leading drivers for why we see these correlations with increased social media use and less happiness and less sociality. So this behavior of constantly looking at the phone, it's not intrinsic to this technology. In fact, we had both social media and smartphones for years before it became normal to look at your phone all the time. The reason we do that, and this is the behavior that's causing all these issues, the reason we do that is that around the point when the major social media platforms were preparing for their IPOs, they completely re-engineered the social media experience. So instead of it being about posting and reading your friend's post, it became about this steady incoming stream of social approval indicators, like likes, and retweets, and comments. And so now you had a reason to keep going back to the phone because every time you hit this, there might be another reward there, another indication of social approval. None of that was in the original social media model, but they added it because it changed it from something you checked every once in a while to something that you checked all the time, and it was really hard to resist. And then that changed our entire relationship with these devices. And so now we think about it as something we look at all the time. It sort of trained us to, to think of it like this constant companion that we always need to be looking at in every downtime. But that's very recent uh, and is very contrived and it's causing a lot of trouble. Well, I mean, a, a lot of these studies are correlational. You're looking at different generations, you're looking at different birth years, and you're trying to understand, in general, why is that population different? So when it came to teenagers and mental health, there was this sort of off the charts moment hmm. where the demographers that measure different properties of different generations when they got to this Generation Z, the first generation to have ubiquitous access to smartphones starting their adolescence, uh, these mental health issues increased more rapidly than anything they'd ever seen before increased between any generation. Whoa. So it was literally off the charts. Like they don't see changes. Usually the changes between generations is much more gradual. Mm. And so you get to this birth year in the 90s that puts you at the smartphone era in your early adolescence, mm. and that goes up. Wow. Right. And so they're trying to figure out why, but like any good demographers, you, you see there could be a lot of different issues. So there could be a lot of different conjectures. And so they explored a lot of different things, but the timing wasn't working out for other things. They thought, well, maybe it has to do with, you know, the Great Recession and economic anxiety, but that started earlier. And, and this didn't start till a, a little bit later. And they're like, well, maybe it's like political stuff and everyone's stressed out, but no, no, that's much later. Uh, that, that comes much later, so they're, they're really trying to figure this out. And they said, well, maybe it's self-reporting. Okay, so maybe, yes, it's true that starting at this birth year, people report anxiety, anxiety-related disorders, but we've just become more used to that, and so maybe just people are more comfortable. But then they looked at the hospitalization data, and hospitalizations for self-harm went right up with it, right? So it's not a reporting error. And so what you see is this sort of narrowing of consensus around the idea that there's really no other explanation that fits the data as well as giving social media to adolescents. That's what's causing it. The question is, how do we improve our relationship more generally mm. with technology in our personal life? And so the philosophy that I teach is digital minimalism, which just takes minimalism, which has been around forever. And it's an ancient idea. You should focus on the things that are really, really valuable to the exclusion of other things that are much less valuable. So by putting your attention on the things that you know for sure give you big wins and concentrating intensely on them, you can do better than taking that same attention and trying to spread it over many more things that, that also give you smaller wins. So if you apply this to your digital life, 
uh, what you get is a, a, a approach to the apps and the services and, and the, the gadgets that says, I only want to use digital tools that give me really big returns on a small number of things I really care about. And I'm happy missing out on everything else. Which is a completely different way of thinking about it than I think most people have thought about their personal digital life, which is much more of a maximalist mindset. Hey, this thing might bring me some value or some convenience, and I don't want to miss out on that. So I might as well try it out. I might as well download that app, or I might as well sign up for it. This sort of more haphazard approach. The digital minimalists say, no, 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 I know what I'm all about. I know what I want to do with my time. I know what's important to me. And I put tech to work incredibly strategically to help those things I really care about, and then everything else that's out there, I just ignore. Well, I mean, attention residue is the, the killer for almost any creative endeavor. And it comes out of the psychology literature. If you're focused on something difficult, and then you shift your attention over to something else. And even if it's for one minute, right? Like you shift over to look at an email or whatever, and then you come back to the original hard thing, there's a residue left from that context switch. And that residue takes a while to clear out. And until it clears out, your cognitive performance has declined. And so the problem is, is the way that a lot of us work today, when we bring on more and more demands or that we're really plugged in the email or, or, or social media or what have you, is that we're constantly doing these quick checks. Mm. And we feel like, hey, we're single, we're doing the right thing. I don't have this window open at the same time as this window. I'm not multitasking anymore. I've got it all figured out. But what, what we're not realizing is the context switch of each of these quick checks is creating attention residue. Solitude is freedom from input from other minds. So it has nothing to do with physical isolation. I mean, in this room, you could certainly be in solitude if you were just alone with your own thoughts, but if you're up on a mountaintop, completely isolated, but have earbuds in, <laughs> right? You're not in solitude. So it's nothing to do with physical isolation. It's what mode your brain is in. So if, you're, if your brain is processing input that was generated from another mind, you're not in solitude. And if it's not, it's just observing or thinking its own thoughts. You are in a state of solitude. And what we know is that Solitude is crucial. You have to have this on a regular basis in your life if you're gonna flourish and thrive as a human being. Now this wasn't a problem until about seven years ago because it was unavoidable that you were gonna have solitude just going about your day-to-day -day business, right? You would just, you'd be in the car, you didn't like what was on the radio, solitude. You're in line at the drugstore uh, and you have to wait 10 minutes, it's solitude. But for the first time in human history, we've created the technology that makes it possible to banish every last moment of solitude from your life because now you have ubiquitous high-speed wireless internet and the supercomputer in your pocket and there's big back-end algorithms that will feed up to you a sort of optimized selection of nuggets at any moment. The problem with that is it gets all solitude out of your life, creating a syndrome called solitude deprivation syndrome which we're not really wired for and it makes us anxious, it impedes our development, it impedes our creative and professional insights, it's not good. You know, in digital minimalism, I'm so concerned about people being very blithe about how they're going to change what sociality means. Like, I'm going to do things on my phone now, I'm going to be doing streaks on Snapchat and, and, and selfies, and like, let's just completely change, you know, what it means to be social. Um, that has big impacts because we know, we've known since the ancients, that what do you need to also feel like a flourishing, thriving human being is you have to take responsibility for and sacrifice on behalf of family, close friends, and community. You can't just do that. It has to be, um, I am connected and serving the people in my immediate orbit. We need that as well, the flourish. So in your work, focusing to do really good things. And in your social life, focusing to actually be there and serve and sacrifice for family, close friends, and community. This is like an ancient formula for flourishing as a human being. A lot of recent tech has inadvertently pushed us away from those things.